Good day and welcome to the CDI Talks. My name is Anton Shekhovtsov and I'm the director of the Austria-based NGO Center for Democratic Integrity that analyzes attempts of authoritarian regimes to influence politics in Europe. My guest today is Velina Chekarova, the director of the Austrian Institute for European and Security Policy. She also conducts strategic foresight and trans analysis for the Austrian Defense Ministry. Vilina Chekarova currently writes a book on the dragon bear. She coined this term to refer to China and Russia, so she writes a book on the dragon's bear impact on global affairs based on systems thinking, strategic foresight, geopolitics, and geoeconomics. Do like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel to get notified on the future episodes of the CDI Talks. Vilina, thank you very much for this conversation. Uh, let me ask you first. You coined the term dragon bear in 2015, so several years ago. Now it's being used, as, as you mentioned, by other scholars, by other experts. My question would be, uh, what are the reasons for combining China and Russia under one conceptual roof of the dragon bear? Thank you for the invitation. First and foremost, uh, second, uh, I coined the term the dragon bear in 2015 to point uh, to a game changer in international relations. One that basically is now taking more shape uh, in 2021. And in a sense, uh, I pointed to a unique mode of navigating through the global system transformation. I don't look at uh, the dragon bear that means relations between China and Russia as being based on a strategic alliance nor as an axis of convenience or a marriage of convenience, um, but as a mode of systemic coordination in various key domains and sectors, uh, reaching from uh, trade, energy, uh, to space technologies, that means also navigating the fourth industrial revolution, uh, which is now taking place, um, to military and defense sector, and of course, with all the deviations that are also being entailed. And in a sense, uh, it has been one of the most overlooked uh, geopolitical phenomenon of the last decade um, by the West, uh, either neglecting these realities on the ground or uh, underestimating the possible second order effects of this kind of systemic coordination. But the trend in the bilateral relationship and also meanwhile the multilateral relationship stemming from the dragon bear that means the dragon bear in relations with third regions or third countries is absolutely clear in a sense it is actually it has been growing since 2014 2015 for very uh, obvious reasons we can touch upon them later in this talk but uh, the trend now is also basically uh, positive in all these various domains and key sectors that I've named. But this is also very Western-centric uh, concept because I think Australia, Australian uh, experts would not refer to the dragon bear because for them, the bear, Russia, is not that important as China. Indeed, which also is part of this kind of huge... A phenomenon uh, in the current global affairs that I also describe uh, or at least argue uh, that is uh, going towards a bifurcation of the global system because one of the major um, well anticipations for the last decade by the West by Western analysts was and it still remains that we are living in a multipolarity, uh, that uh, this kind of Western-like, uh, Western-based multilateralism is alive and kicking, and that this actually determines the nature of international relations. Um, per 2021, I argue that we are actually in the uh, in the middle of a greatest the greatest shift in the international relations since the last 70 years and that kind of bifurcation of the global system based on the emergence of two or if you like re-emergence because china has been already a global uh, global power uh, back in the history so in a sense it's a re-emergence re of uh, you know global being global power center uh, so that kind of uh, uh, situation of having two uh, centers of power uh, 
creates a lot of centrifugal forces. You gave the example with Australia. Now, Australia is... Uh, has been oscillating between the two centers of power with uh, uh, having a great geoeconomic cloud uh, in the relations with China. However, now it has actually taken a clear decision in favor of the Anglosphere alliance of uh, powers that actually seek to do what? To build a counterweight to China in uh, the Indo-Pacific region. So in a sense, Russia, as you mentioned, is not there yet. Russia is not in the Indo-Pacific, it's not present there, but that doesn't mean that Russia is not working towards creating opportunities and achieving an access to the Indo-Pacific uh, region. I can give you a few examples. One, of course, is now via the new geopolitical situation in Afghanistan. That, that means that securing the whole Central Asia suddenly becomes a common geopolitical and security-related uh, task for both China and Russia. From there, you take Afghanistan, you take uh, Iran, you have a huge new uh, connectivity, uh, transport, energy, or trade uh, route, if you like. And from Afghanistan, where actually there is already an existent uh, economic corridor in Pakistan via China uh, with a port in Gwadar, you have an access to the Indian Ocean. So in a sense, um, India, India is now a little bit too squeezed in this particular uh, area, but uh, Russia has been working on a transport connectivity with India before the takeover of the Taliban, which has a more than 7,000 kilometer transport corridor connecting India, Iran, and Russia, and from there on, of course, uh, opening an access to the European markets. And in a sense, uh, these kind of projects uh, are going to be now diversified uh, by Chinese rules, of course. But uh, there, uh, I see a huge opportunity for Russia, a new kind of equilibrium, because China cannot do it on its own. And a second example I can give you uh, regarding the Indo-Pacific and why at some point the Dragon Bear is going to be an issue um, in this particular part of the world is that Russia has been trying to uh, actually acquire military presence in several African countries. And if you look at the map, uh, some of them are actually positioned, locate, located in the eastern, at the eastern coasts of uh, Africa. And in a sense, starting from Egypt and then moving uh, basically, uh, vertically along the eastern coast, uh, with, uh, now a failed, uh, attempt to get a military base in Sudan. Once the map looks very different. And in a sense, Russia is going to pursue this interest of getting a direct access and from there to, uh, create a regional power. Um, projection, if you like, in coordination and in cooperation with uh, other partners. Indeed, we see that in Africa, we, we see this competition between China and Russia. They are competing for, for influence, they are competing for resources, I guess, uh, as well. But uh, as, you, as you mentioned in, uh, in several papers of yours uh, uh, on the Dragon Bear, uh, this term does not mean that China and Russia, that their interests are always coincide. They are different. And going back to Europe, I would like to ask you, uh, against the background of the influence of China and Russia in Europe, what are the, what are the differences and similarities between their approaches to this influence in Europe in particular? Before I answer the question, I want to stress that this is exactly the point of uh, not always with each other, but never against each other kind of an approach realizing that their interests and goals do not coincide, but creating opportunities whenever possible, as you gave the example with Africa, uh, where both are simultaneously acting, and the same applies for Europe. So both are on the ground for various reasons. Russia, of course, historically a big player on the old continent, a European power, a former empire. Uh, in a sense, uh, it has always 
looked at uh, this uh, geography, this, this geographic area as uh, actually uh, its uh, own direct vicinity, its own geoeconomic and geopolitical space to penetrate whenever it suits its interests and its goals. And this is not going to change. So in a sense, specifically the former Soviet bloc, the Central Eastern European countries are feeling the pressure and the presence uh, by Russia the most. Now, what is interesting is that China has chosen exactly the same corridors for its economic uh, projects, such as uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, but also the 17 plus 1 initiative. Meanwhile, 16 plus 1 initiative because Lithuania decided to exit this uh, initiative uh, pointing to the importance of having actually a 27 plus 1 initiative when it comes to dealing with China. So, uh, of course, the approaches are different in a sense because China is looking for a geoeconomic cloud first and foremost. So here, the political influence, uh, the full spectrum of a hybrid warfare, taking cyber attacks or disinformation campaigns into considerations are not so important for China. And even during the COVID-19, which was a kind of a eye opener for uh, a lot of European governments, but also societies, uh, when it comes to Chinese uh, influences on the ground was more or less related to positive image creating campaigns rather than what we are used to see uh, from uh, from Russia, which is always trying to destabilize uh, using uh, various uh, tactics, um, instruments, uh, uh, agents of influence. Uh, so it's really a very comprehensive, long-standing approach that Russia has been always using. It has never ceased to exist. That is very important because right now we are listening a lot. Um, we are hearing a lot about uh, hybrid warfare, but hybrid warfare as part of uh, this whole comprehensive non-kinetic way of waging wars with uh, competitors and rivals has always been in place uh, during the time of the Soviet Union and afterwards with Russia being the successor of uh, this kind of tactics. So in a sense, this is I see uh, this is something I see as a huge difference. Meanwhile, however, we are also observing that uh, China has managed to create is islands of political influence as well. Now, if we take, for instance, Greece or uh, Cyprus into consideration, we see that certain political behavior, for instance, when it comes to voting within the European Union um, institutions, uh, has clear, uh, so to say, signs of a kind of a influence in favor of uh, Chinese uh, interests. So that that is a worrisome trend that needs to be tackled, that needs to be addressed, um, where the two actors have also a common approach, um, specifically when it comes to Europe is, of course, when it comes to uh, human rights, uh, value-based uh, international relations and um, the rules-based multilateralism, where you see how both actually do not like this kind of uh, uh, European approach or, if you like, even Western kind of approach. And they really, really tried to uh, undermine uh, undermine it, uh, undermine it via the tools I mentioned, but also by coordinating positions. So let's take, for instance, the UN Security Council uh, as an example, and you see how both have, as permanent members, have actually coordinated positions when they favor, uh, they actually favored uh, certain uh, resolutions when they fitted their interests, and they were voting against mostly uh, US-led resolutions or European-led resolutions. This is going to be problematic in the future. This is going to create more problems. The same applies to other international or regional organizations where the cloud of the two is increasing based exactly on this anti-Western, anti-American, and meanwhile also anti-European agenda. And in a sense... Um, the combination of a growing geoeconomic cloud by China in Europe. And here, it's not just Central and Eastern Europe, because 
China is aiming for the industrial heart of Europe, which is Germany, which is uh, France, which is Italy, which is Spain. And Russia, of course, has um, uh, sought and will seek also in the future a kind of uh, political, uh, Russia-friendly, let's say, Russia-friendly party actors, Russia-friendly governments, Russia-friendly positions, Russia-friendly policies. And this is not going to change. So the combination of the two might create huge problems for the European leadership. European countries assess the uh, well, presumed threats uh, coming from China and Russia in a diff- in a very different way. What explains these differences? Can they be explained only by economic or business interests? To answer directly the the latter, uh, of course not. But in a sense, we are right now in uh, here in Europe. We are right now in a in a process that's called strategic compass where all 27 governments are trying to identify their new so-called threats and uh, and uh, risks uh, and in a sense uh, the next step would be to come together discuss all these various threats and uh, threats perceptions specifically risks and based on this kind of risk analysis to come up with uh, hopefully common common ground for uh, common European threats uh, and uh, risks. A very complex process that is not open to the society. We really don't have any idea what's being what's being discussed uh, behind the curtains. Uh, in a sense, this kind of risk analysis have been conducted by the governments. As I said, at some point there will be announced. Uh, there will be a, definitely an announcement, and they will be published. Hopefully, also uh, the outcome of this process. And uh, the expectation is that during the French presidency next uh, year, in the first half of the next year, that there will be a uh, on a public discussion on that. So currently we are in a situation where there is no there is no real common denominator for uh, security risks uh, and security uh, threats. Um, in a sense, of course, one might argue uh, terrorism, terrorism related activities, uh, might be one of these. I mean, if you look at uh, most of the polls uh, in the European Union countries, this is definitely almost always uh, present. Um, the um, effects from the migration crisis in 2015 are still being felt uh, within the European societies in a sense that also during the polls, um, uh, based on the polls, uh, you will see this as being described as one of the risks. But if you look at the so-called European powers, the big players on the old continent, uh, most of the risks that are being put on the top of the lists by the citizens are of non-security, non-defense nature. So climate change is now number one uh, threat according to the German society. And that is quite telling also how governments are shaping narratives or communicating with their uh, citizens when it comes to the true nature of uh, global affairs. Because in my view, nothing has changed uh, in terms of uh, competition between global and regional powers. Uh, In reality, the risks uh, and the threats have been actually moving towards Europe in both the southern and the eastern neighborhood and in actually this kind of ring of crisis has been uh has be- becoming uh, closer and closer has been coming closer and closer to the european capitals and in a sense whether they like it or not at some point they will have to deal with it in terms also of uh deciding whether hard power needs to be applied or not because other regional actors such as Russia or Turkey, are already doing this. So in a sense, there is a huge dichotomy when it comes to perceptions from the citizens. We have become a kind of an island of the blessed on this continent, where the citizens have no, very often no idea what is going on around us in terms of true security risks and uh, real 
threats. And in a sense, of course, the soft power, the soft power agenda of the European Union is going to determine a lot what is going to be put on this strategic uh, compass, uh, unless uh, the reality hits, uh, so to say, so hard that a lot of pain is being induced. I don't see any real shift in this kind of uh, debates, uh, discussions or whatsoever. Uh, from uh, the use of hard power, t- even in the direct vicinity, to uh, topics such as the use of uh, drones or the use of artificial intelligence, all of these are more or less non-topics. Thank you very much for this conversation and your great insights, Felina. Thank you very much for the invitation. It was a great pleasure. Thank you.